Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, we know that you have very busy Tuesday um, days that you need to be uh, working in, and probably many of you are coming from schools or school-based health centers or health clinics, and you have a lot that you could be doing for this hour, so we very much appreciate you joining us um, for this important training. Um, we are so pleased to be covering this important topic today and so pleased to have our guest presenter. Um, we'll be talking about sexual and reproductive health resources for school-based health centers. Um, in particular, patient-delivered partner therapy and some other resources that Essential Access Health provides. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And, um, our goals for today are to explain the importance of patient-delivered partner therapy as a partner management strategy, to understand how PDPT can be applied in a school-based health setting, and to identify other resources to support adolescent sexual health and caregiver-child communication. Some quick housekeeping. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, you're all automatically muted. Um, we're hoping to um, see around 40 participants today, so we don't have the ability to um, have the mics on, but there will be um, a possibility of chatting and Q&A um, in the typing boxes. Um, the webinar does get recorded and will be posted on our website along with any supporting material. So um, if you miss something, it will be up on our website within the next couple of days, so don't worry. Um, we will have time for questions and answers at the end, um, but feel free to submit any questions or thoughts in the meantime, and I'll try to consolidate them for our presenter at the end. Um, and I want to give a really big thank, thank you to Kayla Heakin. Um, she is an expert presenter, and we're really pleased to have her today um, to talk about this subject. Um, I got a chance to see her recently present, and it was very enlightening and informative, and we thought we really need to bring this to the broader state uh, field of school-based health centers, so we really appreciate her time this morning. Um, sorry, I'm also Amy Ranger. Um, I'm the Director of Programs here at California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, I'm hearing that there's a little bit of an audio lag, so I'm trying um, a different way to speak, so hopefully that will be a little bit better. Um, my name is Amy Ranger. I'm the Director of Programs at the California School-Based Health Alliance, so hopefully you all can hear me okay. Um, the California School-Based Health Alliance is a statewide nonprofit. Um, our mission is to improve the health and academic success of young people by advancing health services in schools. We do this by promoting school-based health centers and school health programming. Um, we have an annual conference that happens every year in May and a lot of other tools and trainings, both in person and virtual, um, that you can tap into on a variety of topics. Um, we've specifically heard a request for more sexual and reproductive health resources, so this webinar is the beginning of that series, um, and we're hoping to bring other topics to in-person trainings and webinars in the future. If you have specific um, topics that you'd like to see us cover, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we are a membership organization of um, health centers and school districts and schools and um, school-based health centers. So if you are not already a member, please consider becoming one. Uh, it does provide a discount to our annual conference as well as access to member-only tools and resources, um, including other webinars like these. And on that note, I'm going to pass it over to Kayla, who's going to talk to us about um, patient-delivered partner therapy and other sexual and reproductive health resources. Thank you so much, Kayla, for joining us. Thank you, Amy, for introducing me, and thank you to everyone um, who has joined us today. Again, my name is Kayla Heakin, and I am a sexual and reproductive health program associate with Essential Access Health. Some of you may already be somewhat familiar with our work, but I hope today um, to share some programs with you that may be relevant, particularly for those of you who are coming from school-based health centers. So Essential Access Health 
works championing and promoting quality sexual and reproductive health care for all through an umbrella of programs, including our STD Prevention Center, which is funded by the California Department of Public Health STD Control Branch, the LA County Division of HIV and STD programs, and the Title X Family Planning Program. Through these partnerships, we administer the Chlamydia and Gonorrhea Patient Delivered Partner Therapy Distribution Program, which I help oversee. And in that program, we provide a free supply of partner treatment to eligible clinics statewide. We support clinics that are interested in implementing PDPT and also provide technical assistance to help clinics operationalize PDPT regardless of whether they currently participate in our free medication program or not. We also offer digital resources for adolescents and parents that we're going to dive into a little bit further, and I'll share with you all at the end as well, our whole training arm and uh, library of trainings that you can access as well. So just to warm things up a little bit, um, I know that we're not in the same physical space, but to be able to get to know you all and who all is kind of here in this space, um, if you could enter into the chat, just introducing yourself as to who you are and maybe how you would answer one of these two statements. Where I work, people say blank about STDs, or I manage STDs through blank. So I could share that, again, I am Kayla Heakin, and I manage STDs through providing a network of over 300 clinics in the state of California with free medication for patient-delivered partner therapy. So looking forward to getting to know some of you in the chat box, if you can enter in who you are and where you work, what people say about STDs, or how you manage STDs. And if you, if you don't see a chat box on your screen, there should be some round buttons at the bottom, and one of them looks like a little talking circle. So if you click on that, you should be able to see the, a chat box on your screen. Okay, great. Starting to see some coming. Sorry, I think the chat sometimes defaults just to go to the host, so you have to select host or panelist or all participants. We are getting a lot of answers um, from people saying that there's not enough discussion of STIs or STDs in their setting. Um, people saying they don't offer health classes anymore. There's not a lot of discussion. Yeah, I'm seeing some come in now. Where I work, people say, ew. Definitely can uh, relate to that experience from experiences working with teens, right? And even with adults as well. Awesome, helping to diagnose, test, and treat. Fantastic. Providing resources. 
even working not directly with students, this can still be important resources to know. Thank you all who've introduced yourself, seeing some more coming in. Huber education, super important. Definitely the, the traumatizing pictures, right, that um, sometimes all students remember is uh, what symptomatic infections might look like for some people um, and not even always a reflection of the majority of infections. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to introduce yourself. I hope a couple times throughout this uh, webinar, I'll be asking you all to participate and engage with each other a little bit. And though we can't be in person, a good chance to kind of get to see where people are coming from. Um, and thank you so much for sharing who you are. So we're going to um, continue forward. So the programs that I'm going to cover today, um, the primary focus of this presentation is going to be going over the chlamydia and gonorrhea patient delivered partner therapy distribution program that I help oversee. We're also going to be talking about teensource.org, which is a sexual health and relationships and know your rights resource for teens by teens. The condom access project, getting access for youth to condoms in need without putting a barrier in the way. Hookup, which is our text messaging service for teens, and then talkwithyourkids.org, which is a caregiver and child communication resource. And please note, if you have questions that come up, you can pop them in the chat box, um, and Amy will be checking them throughout, and we'll have time at the end um, to answer questions about all the different programs that we discussed. So to step the stage a little bit, I wanted to provide a quick overview of current STD epidemiology and data related to reinfection rates. So as you can see from this graph that I have up here, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and primary and secondary syphilis are on the rise in California, as well as being on the rise throughout the country. When we look specifically at chlamydia, these are the rankings by county incident rate. So you can look in here and kind of see where your county falls. I know the text is a little bit small, but you can also look at this uh, information on the California DPH STD control branch website. And the top 10 counties right now I have up here for highest rates of chlamydia, we have San Francisco, Alpine County, Fresno County, and Kings County being in the top five. And just kind of important to know and get a picture of your county to see how that may be affecting, particularly those of you in school-based health centers, how that might be showing up in your school or with the young people that you work with. Looking at gonorrhea rates, um, the top five counties are San Francisco, Lake County, Los Angeles County, Kern County, and Del Norte County. And again, you can look here and kind of see where the ranking falls for your particular county and how it lines up with the state rate, which is the red line running through. And then for early syphilis ranking, here we have the top five counties, San Francisco County, San Joaquin, Fresno County, Kern County, and Kings County. So this is just to give you a little bit of a picture of what might be going on in your county, how that can kind of compare to other regions throughout the state, and also to say that STDs are not something that only happens in one space. Um, or one part of the state, but this is something that's relevant everywhere. And especially when working with adolescents as a population who may be at higher risk for STDs, it's important to keep in mind and keep in consideration. So along with talking about infections, I want to talk about reinfection as well. STD reinfection is very common. 
a study of family packs and Quest Diagnostics data shows that chlamydia reinfection rates among women within six months of the initial infection are up to two to three times baseline positivity rates. Reinfection rates are high across all age groups, as you can see by the green bar that's in this graph. And with reinfection being common, it also can be dangerous, particularly for people with the uterus. So, in fact, complications like pelvic inflammatory disease and ectopic pregnancy become more likely with each repeat infection. So, where primary prevention is really important, preventing reinfection is also of great importance as well. And when we're talking about preventing reinfection, we need to discuss partner management. So I'm going to ask you all again if you can uh, type in the chat box and if you can see um, when you type in, if you can select all participants, it'll be viewable to myself, the administrator, as well as everyone else who is participating alongside you. If you want to share, how does your clinic treat partners of STD positive patients? So if you have a patient who's positive, what does partner management or partner treatment look like for you all? And if you want to select all participants and enter in the chat box some of the strategies that you use. Okay, so in some settings, connecting people to outside resources, some folks not testing for STDs yet. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for everybody who um, sent in responses as to how you currently treat partners of positive patients. So I'm going to go over a little bit, some of these may be strategies that you already use or have wanted to use. Oh, somebody's already using patient-delivered partner treatment. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go over some of the common uh, partner management strategies. So because repeat infections often result from sex with a current partner who did not receive treatment, the California Department of Public Health recommends treating all sexual partners from the two months prior to a patient's positive chlamydia and or gonorrhea test result. And um, if someone hasn't had partners in the last two months, it can be the most recent partners. There's a number of ways to help patients get their partners treated. The three that we have in bold up here are the ones that have been shown to be the most effective 
in getting the partners treated and reducing reinfection. So the first one we have is BYOP, as we call it, um, bring your own partner, where a patient brings their partner to a clinic at the same time that they're also getting treatment. Expedited partner therapy, and then patient-delivered partner therapy, which is a method of expedited partner therapy. EDPT is what it's called for short, is an evidence-based alternative for treating sex partners of patients who are unable or unlikely to visit a health center for their own treatment. And it involves the index patient providing them with appropriate medication or prescription, along with educational materials for the index patient's sex partner or partners. So how does PDPT work? Once a patient's diagnosis has been confirmed, there is an attempt to bring in the partner as well. It's always the best case scenario to be able to bring in a partner into the clinic for them to get a medical evaluation and to get seen by a doctor or medical provider directly. But there are cases where partners are really unable or unlikely to seek timely clinical services and they can be provided PDPT. This involves giving the index patient the appropriate medication or prescription and educational materials. And those educational materials include what STD they're testing positive for, how the STD is transmitted, the treatment plan for the STD, including getting recommended to get retested in three months, information about the medication itself with instructions and warnings, clinic referrals, and additional items like condoms and other barrier methods can be included. And it's particularly important when working with adolescents to emphasize that the treatment is for one specific infection rather than saying that it could treat multiple infections if that's not the case. So ensuring that the young person knows it's not a one pill cure all solution. A number of randomized controlled trials have demonstrated the effectiveness of PDPT for reducing chlamydia and gonorrhea reinfection in the index patient. In this summary slide from the California Department of Public Health STD control branch, it shows that there's results from five randomized controlled trials. The bars in the graph show the percent of patients who were reinfected at a follow-up visit. The purple bar show the reinfection rate among those who were assigned patient referral. So the patient was responsible for referring their partner to a clinic for treatment. The orange bars show the reinfection rate amongst those who were assigned to receive patient-delivered partner therapy. The first four studies looked at reinfection for chlamydia only or both chlamydia and gonorrhea demonstrate reduced reinfection rates for those receiving PDPT. The last two studies also had a third category, which is the green bars that also worked quite well at reducing reinfection. This group was assigned to patient referral, but they also got booklets that had tarot cards with information about the infection and treatment guidelines to give to their partner. PDPT has not shown the same effectiveness in reducing reinfection for trichomoniasis. So that's something to be aware of as well. When talking about the differences between first-line treatment and PDPT, the medication provided for chlamydia is the same as the medication that a patient would get directly in visit. But the medication for gonorrhea treatment is different between first-line treatment and patient-delivered partner therapy. When someone is getting patient-delivered partner therapy, they will receive cefixime, 400 milligram dose of cefixime in place of a ceftriaxone injection. And both uh, in first-line treatment and in patient-delivered partner therapy, the medication is paired with azithromycin as a dual treatment to help prevent antibiotic resistance. A thing to note about cefixime, which is used for gonorrhea patient-delivered partner therapy, 
is that it has been shown to be less effective in treating gonorrhea of the throat or pharyngeal gonorrhea. So it's important if you think that your patient's partner may be at risk for gonorrhea in the throat to do all your best effort to ensure that they actually get seen directly in a clinic and treated there um, to get the ceftriaxone medication. Looking at the legal status of EPT, we'll start just by looking at it throughout the country as a whole. Here we can see mostly a green map, which is great. Um, as you can see, EPT and PDPT is permissible in most states across the United States. Um, it was just recently legalized in Kentucky, which is great because it went from being prohibited to being permissible. Um, so that's fantastic. And as we can see, California is in the green. So in California, patient-delivered partner therapy has been legal since 2001 for chlamydia and since 2007 for other STDs. California legislation, section 120582 of the Health and Safety Code, provides an exception to the Medical Practice Act, which states that prescribing, dispensing, or furnishing of dangerous drugs as defined without good faith prior examination and medical indication constitutes unprofessional conduct. This new law provides that a licensee acting in accordance with provisions of the law in regard to a prescription for antibiotic therapy has not committed unprofessional conduct under this provision. And in the case of adverse events, there's been a toll-free number for the first six years since PDPT became allowable in California. And in 2007, it transitioned to an email address, which is ept at cdph.ca.gov, and as well as a main office and warm line. And there have been no adverse events reported since PDPT has been made allowable in California. Talking a little more about medical legal considerations, um, because this is a common question that we get, is that the liability for PDPT for a provider is no different than the liability of any other action taken by a healthcare provider. And the best way to reduce medical legal liability risk is to practice evidence-based medicine as outlined by national and state guidelines and accompanying PDPT with patient counseling and health education materials is crucial. So PDPT is an allowable, recommended, and evidence-based practice. While there is no current legislation around PDPT explicitly protecting healthcare providers against lawsuits resulting from adverse outcomes related to this practice, the liability, again, is no different from the liability of any other action taken by a healthcare provider, including prescribing or dispensing medicine for any medical condition in which the provider remains liable. The best way to reduce liability risk is to practice evidence-based medicine as outlined by national and state guidelines. And it's PDPT is, again, evidence-based and supported by strong CDC and CDPH guidelines, as well as endorsed by multiple medical associations that we have listed up here. So which partners should get PDPT? Again, there needs to be a partner management strategy for all sex partners within the last two months of an index patient's diagnosis. And if someone has not had sex partners in the last two months, getting treatment for most recent sex partners. There's no limit to the number of doses that can be distributed in the case of multiple sex partners. This is a question that I get asked a lot. Um, you know, is there, is it this number? Is it that number of how many doses you can give to a patient? It's really up to you identifying with your patient what partners of theirs PDPT would be a good fit for. And that's how many doses um, that you can provide to that particular patient. 
and sex, gender, and sexual orientation of a patient should not impact the consideration as to whether PDPT is a fit for them or not. And when it comes to counseling, we have a lot of resources around that as well in determining when PDPT is a good fit. So when PDPT is not recommended, if a patient is co-infected with other STDs that are not covered by PDPT medication, um, particularly uh, syphilis, it's not recommended for people to be um, given PDPT so that, that we want to make sure that that person gets full care and gets care for the other STDs that are not going to be treated by the medicine. Any type of situation when a patient's safety is in question, so whether it's suspected child abuse, sexual assault, or any other situation where you question whether a patient's safety would still be intact if they were provided with PDPT or had to discuss PDPT with their partner, PDPT is not the best route in that scenario. If a partner has known severe allergies to antibiotics, so adverse reactions to single-dose cefixime and azithromycin beyond mild to moderate side effects are very rare, and the risk of allergy and adverse drug reactions can be best mitigated through educational materials that accompany the medication. Um, as I mentioned before, pharyngeal gonorrhea or gonorrhea of the throat, PDPT medication is not as effective at tre treating gonorrhea infections in the throat, so if you suspect that a patient's partner is potentially at risk for gonorrhea in the throat based on your counseling with your patient and determining what the potential risks are, um, it's not best to give them PDPT. It's best to do um, make your efforts to bring them into the clinic and ensure that they get treated in a visit. And then if patients are symptomatic or have a more serious condition, um, and have symptoms, we want to really try to ensure that the partner is brought in to meet all of their health needs. So some ways to bring PDPT to your clinic. There's three main ways um, that you could bring it. So one would be by participating in essential access health free chlamydia and gonorrhea PDPT distribution program, which I'll go into a little more detail about in just a couple slides. Secondly would be purchasing PDPT medication for your clinic to distribute to the patient or their partner on site, and that would be from your own stock of medication that you're purchasing for your clinic. And then third would be providing the patient with a prescription for the partner to be filled at a local pharmacy. At this time, Medi-Cal and FamPact don't currently reimburse for medication. So just really important to know that that's part of, um, that's a current gap that does exist that's important to keep in mind about routes to bringing patient-delivered partner therapy to your clinic. So let's talk a little bit about patient-delivered partner therapy, specifically in a school-based health setting. So I have a case study of May. So May is a 16-year-old female who is at the school-based health center for a sports physical. She decides to get tested for chlamydia and for gonorrhea during her visit. Her gonorrhea test comes back positive, and she said she uses condoms sometimes. She shares that she has had two partners in the last two months. One partner goes to school here and one partner graduated from high school last year and lives two towns over. So there's a lot of things to kind of consider here. First of all, looking at May's case, we want to consider why it could be important to discuss sexual health in a primary care setting. We can also think about with May, what more information do we need to know about May's partners to assess if PDPT is a good fit? 
And another key piece here is how might partner management strategies differ for a May's partner who attends school at the same school as her versus her partner who lives two towns over? So I have one hopefully short question for you all to respond to in the chat box. We don't have a poll function, but if you could just respond yes or no what your thoughts are. Can May receive PDPT as a minor? So can May receive patient-delivered partner therapy to um, take to her partners as a minor? Fantastic, y'all are on it. Um, so definitely, May can receive PDPT as a minor because PDPT is considered a part of ST treatment, which minors 12 and above are able to consent to in the state of California as part of minor consent law. So looking at some of these considerations in May's case, um, it's important to consider that when you're discussing partner management with a patient at a school-based health center, there might be some partners that attend the same school and there might be partners that don't go to school there or may not be engaged in school. Offering on-site treatment for patients is particularly important with adolescents because they're less likely to fill prescriptions for STD treatments. And if a partners attend the same school, you can consider leveraging the school-based model to bring partners in for first-line treatment. Maybe for one of May's partners, you might be able to actually pull them from class and bring them in. For partners who don't attend the same school, it could be good to consider PDPT in those cases, particularly if you're not sure that that partner is gonna be able to actually get in for a visit. So now I want to talk a little bit more about essential access health, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. Kayla, I think we lost you there. Maybe you got muted somehow. I think we might be having some technical difficulties, unless perhaps everyone else can still hear Kayla, but I cannot. Um, please chat to me or Q&A to me if you can hear Kayla. Are you able to hear me now? Oh, now we can. Thank goodness you came back. <laughs> Great. Thanks. I had a little network glitch. Thank you all for your patience. Yes. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. So um, again, Essential Access Health Chlamydia and Gonorrhea Patient Delivered Partner Therapy Distribution Program is a partnership between the California Department of Public Health STD Control Branch, as well as Essential Access Health, who've been working together since 2005 to implement this program. The program provides a free supply of prepackaged medication to treat the sex partners of patients diagnosed with chlamydia and or gonorrhea to eligible clinics in California. The purchase of medication is funded through the California Department of Public Health, SD Control Branch, and Essential Access Health fulfills the administrative role of the program. To support clinics that are interested in implementing PDPT, we also provide technical assistance to help operationalize PDPT regardless of whether or not patients are currently participating in the free medication program. Um, and the program works by sending medication directly to your clinic. We offer specialized technical assistance to support with implementation, counseling, and patient awareness. 
and also offer first access to the newest resources and trainings on patient-delivered partner therapy. And a couple notes about eligibility questions that might come up here. Serving a population that's at risk for STDs, adolescents fall under um, that designation. And then serving an uninsured or underinsured population can include serving a population that accesses Medi-Cal or family PAC clients. And like I said before, that um, with Medi-Cal and Family Pack, they don't currently reimburse for medication. And I see we have some questions around that that we'll address when we get to the question section at the end. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. So this is an operations map of the program. So how it works is that for your agency, you designate a point person who manages the PDPT orders, meaning that they're the one who um, will register for an account and add information for all participating sites. They place an order online through our online platform by the 20th of the month and report aggregate data, which I'll show you all what uh, the data is since the last order. They receive a medication shipment directly at a uh, site during the first two weeks of the following month and then they dispense medication, educational materials, and clinic referrals to patients to give to their partners. When it comes to ordering medication, what the data reporting looks like, the aggregate data that we ask for, um, we don't require line listed data, but we do need some aggregate data to assess the reach and the effectiveness of the program. And with each new medication order, each clinic site must report these data about the number of positive cases and doses dispensed uh, since the last order was placed. And these are broken down by infection and broken down by gender. And the majority of clinics we've worked with are already collecting data like this. But if it doesn't seem feasible for your clinic, we don't want reporting to be a barrier for you to participating in the program. So, We've worked with clinics in the past around creating tailored reporting solutions as well. The participation requirements for staying in the program include providing on-site index patient to, uh, for chlamydia and gonorrhea, distributing PDPT to patients for treatment of their partners that are unable or unlikely to seek care based on treatment, to dispense PDPT with the educational materials and clinic referral. And we have some educational materials available on our website for download to print as well. We also recommend maintaining a log of all PDP dis uh, medication dispensed and watching the Essential Access Health PDPT webinar series at least once. So on our Learning Exchange website, which I'll show to you all in a minute, we offer uh, free trainings on our patient-delivered partner therapy program, as well as counseling around patient-delivered partner therapy. Kayla, just a quick time check. Um, it's about 12.45. Thanks so much, Amy. So this is a sample of what our uh, patient education materials look like. We have them available in several different languages, and we also um, are going to be publishing soon resources available in Armenian and Tagalog. We also have posted up uh, links for the California Department of Public Health guidelines around patient-delivered partner therapy and really gives some different uh, pointers and tips around counseling for providers as well. And as well, if you don't see a resource that you're looking for or if there's something that you need that's not available, we have created resources with clinics as well um, that have been tailored to their specific needs. And this is uh, our newly released patient-delivered partner therapy counseling guide for providers that we're really excited about that is available for download on our website that is designed to enhance providers' knowledge, skills, and comfort in effectively counseling patients around PDPT. It was developed together with Essential Access Health and California Department of Public Health STD Control Branch 
that helps determine if PDPT is right um, for patients and really gives um, more confidence to providers in how to counsel around PDPT. We have technical assistance offerings that we offer around PDPT. And then some take home points specifically around PDPT is that reinfection is common and dangerous for the patient. It's preferable for partners to come into the clinic to get treated. When this is unlikely, PDPT is an allowable, recommended, and evidence-based alternative to ensure that partners receive treatment. The liability for PDPT in California is no different than the liability from any other action taken by a healthcare provider. And Essential Access Health Chlamydia and Gonorrhea Patient Delivered Partner Therapy Distribution Program provides a supply of free prepackaged PDPT to eligible sites. So if you'd like to learn more specifically about this program, you can visit essentialaccess.org slash PDPT. I know we're a little short on time and I still wanna reserve some time for questions. So I'm gonna talk with you all quickly about some of our other offerings and programs that may be of interest at your school-based health centers in particular, and then we'll have some time for questions. So we have a number of programs that we offer from Essential Access through Teen Source, Hookup, the Condom Access Project, and Talk With Your Kids. These are resources that are for teens or for caregivers and children around sexual health, knowing your rights and relationships. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of these different programs, which some of you may already know about. So teensource.org is our website for teens by teens. It includes information on birth control, STDs, relationships, and rights to young people in California. It's for youth, by youth, and we use youth-generated, youth-vetted content. And we also provide advocacy and engagement opportunities for young people to use their unique voice. You can see some of our social media links up here if you'd like to connect with us. One really cool feature about our Teen Source website is our clinic finder, where young people can find a clinic near them using the search function with their zip code. We also have our condom access project where we provide young people access to condoms without barriers. They can find condoms near them on our condom map. And um, there's over 100 different sites across 36 local health jurisdictions where young people can walk in and receive condoms without barriers. And if you're interested in becoming a condom access site, you can contact us about that. We also have eight mailer counties Alameda, Fresno, Kern, Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Bernardino, San Diego, and San Joaquin, where young people can have condoms actually mailed directly to their home. We have the hookup app where, um, sorry, hookup texting service, where young people get a text every single week on Wednesday that has a quick tip around relationships, health, or sexuality and it links to a longer blog post. And you can also text the Hookup app clinic with your zip code to find a clinic near you. And then lastly, another great resource we have is Talk With Your Kids, which uh, re-envisions the idea of the talk from a one-time occurrence to the fact that parents and caregivers give messages to the children in their life from a young age through teenagehood about relationships, about health, about sex. And we have a timeline on talkwithyourkids.org that goes through age-appropriate topics and activities that caregivers can engage in with their children. So going forward, we're always looking for partners, some different ways that we can connect. You can visit essentialaccess.org slash PDPT if you're interested in joining our PDPT distribution program. You can join our condom access project at teensource.org slash condoms slash free. You can contact us to order and share resources. Um, we're happy to share opportunities with youth to create content like blogs, hookup texts, and more. And you can explore further trainings on essentialaccesstraining.org. 
So I know we have a little more time for questions. So that'll be our time now to chat a little bit more. Thank you, Kayla, that was so helpful. So far we have four questions and maybe some more will come in while you're answering these. Um, the first question we got was the original stats that you show, showed um, for the STI rates across counties, was that for adolescents specifically or the general population? That was specifically for the general population, thank you for asking that. That was not broken down um, in a specific age group. Okay, great. And then there was a question about partners that need the treatment but do not have family packed. How does it work when picking up the prescription from the pharmacy? But I believe you said that it's not covered by family pack, so that would be irrelevant. So are, are, patient, are partners having to just pay at cost? Yeah, unfortunately where things are at right now, if it's a prescription model and, um, and the patients uh, are, handing in a prescription, then it's a case where they have to pay out of pocket. Um, so that's something that I know the SC control branch is constantly working on and trying to make reimbursement a reality so the access can go further. But that's also part of why um, we have the distribution program as well, because we know that there's a gap there um, where mm -hmm. people may not be able to access treatment directly, but they still need to get treated. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's the state of things right now when it comes to uh, prescription treatment. So the solution to removing the barrier of cost is to have people become part of the Essential Access Health program so that they can get these um, medications available for free from you all to dispense to patients to give to their partners. Definitely, yeah. So the current options in terms of ensuring that the partners don't have to pay for the medication are either joining uh, our program or um, some clinics have chosen and agencies have chosen to buy their own supply of medication that they distribute. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then I just wanted to clarify something that I think that you had told me is based on eligibility of the program, um, based on both patient uh, uh, STI risks that since most of our school-based health centers are indeed serving adolescents and since most of them are serving adolescents with a high proportion of FPACT or Medi-Cal, they would all be eligible for participation in this program. Is that true? Yes, that is true. So um, in our uh, kind of broad eligibility guidelines, we consider folks who are Medi-Cal and family packed patients to still be patients who are potentially underinsured. Um, so they would still be eligible. Excellent. So I think this is one of the main reasons that we really wanted to bring you on today is to have all of our 277 school-based health centers in California realize that they're eligible for participation in this program and that they should explore it um, with Essential Access Health and their lead agencies because it seems like a best practice to have. There was a question that came about having to have a pharmacy dispensing license that some of our school-based health centers are writing prescriptions but not actually dispensing medication. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so um, first I will say just in terms of if someone has a Kate, uh, question about their specific uh, dispensing, I'm happy to talk about that more one-on-one -on -one to provide a little more uh, specialized guidance. But generally I can say it's uh, important to know for if you're doing direct in-visit treatment, a uh, pharmacy license isn't required, um, but if you're not met, but if you're not providing medication on site, um, that's where things get a little more tricky in terms of licensing. So if you're considering now providing medication on site for PDPT, that's something we've worked through with a couple clinics as well. So something we can talk about further, but um, kind of like I talked about a little bit in the case study with May too, we really emphasize when possible to provide um, in-visit treatment directly for adolescents, uh, just because they've been shown to be a lot less likely to fill prescriptions than adults. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I want to close this out with two last quick questions. Um, yeah. We didn't cover PEP and PrEP today, although I think that would be a great um, subject for another webinar. Um, the question was, is it possible that in the future, Family Pact will be able to cover PEP or PrEP? Do you have any sense of that, or should we save that for the next webinar? Um, I think we can save that for the next webinar, but I would just say I would love that. 
So mm-hmm. that's all. <laughs> yeah. Great. So that seems like a good advocacy uh, um, opportunity yeah. um, and a great topic for future trainings. Yeah. Um, the last question is an easy one, which is, um, are the slides going to be available for attendees? Yes, we will send them out to everyone who participated, and they will be on the California School-Based Health Alliance website. I'm going to go ahead and um, just move us forward on the slides, Kayla, if you don't mind, and show our um, website as well as your email address and phone number. Um, so you can find the slides there. They will also be sent to you, and you can are welcome to follow up directly with Kayla for any questions about any of the programs she discussed or with me about any other suggestions you have about trainings you'd like to see or support you need for your school health program or school-based health center. Um, and just with our very last minute, I want to remind folks that our annual conference happens every year in May, and this year it's May 14th through 15th in Sacramento. It's going to be um, particularly awesome with lots of great advocacy, and that might be a good chance to tell your, your legislators that you think that FPAC should cover not only PEP and PrEP, but also um, patient-delivered partner therapy. So hope to see you all then and on future webinars. Um, the next CSAJ webinar is on October 17th, and it's about protecting our immigrant families, particularly in light of the public charge regulations coming up. Um, so thank you so much to Kayla for um, bringing all of her expertise today. Thank you so much to all of you for participating on your, in your busy Tuesday. Um, Kayla, any last words? Just want to say thank you all so much. and. Uh, Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions or want to talk further. would love to talk to you again and hope to connect soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a great day.